What's up everybody? If you've done any growing outside in the garden, in the dirt, you know there's a lot of stuff you've got to worry about to make sure that your plants do well, that uh, things produce fruit, etc. If you've done indoor growing or are just getting into hydroponic growing, you can feel like there's a lot of stuff you've got to worry about, even more stuff, which may or may not be true, but it can feel like that because I think there's some things unique to indoor growing. Even though some of the principles are the same, there's different things you've got to do when you grow indoors. Um, and that I think can feel overwhelming. So I want to talk about some of these rules, some of these things that you have to have and talk about, well, what if you don't? What if I don't have money for all those little tools? What if I don't want to measure my pH? What if I don't want to measure my total dissolved solids and a few other things? Um, can you bend these rules or even break these rules? So let's get to it. First, let's talk about pH. pH is the measurement of how acidic or how alkaline a solution is. With respect to hydroponics, it matters because plants absorb nutrients best when that pH is within a certain band. Lettuce, for example, uh, prefers a nutrient solution with the pH of 6 to 6.5. Other plants are fairly close in that range, but it does vary by plant. And I'll put a link in the description below to um, a chart that has the various preferred pHs for different crops. Well, what happens if you don't have a solution that's within that range? Well, if you're Lettuce is a fairly tolerant plant, so if you're a little bit outside that, let's say you're even a 5.5 to maybe a 7, you're probably going to be just fine. Lettuce will do just fine. Once you get above 7, though, things start to happen to the solution. Iron will begin to precipitate out as the more alkaline the solution gets. And you know what they say, if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem, which is exactly what happens. If the iron's not in the solution, then the plant can't absorb the iron, and leading to chlorosis and other problems with the plants. This is also true with other micronutrients. The further outside of the preferred band you get, the less able the plant is to absorb the nutrients that it needs. So that's why pH is important, and that's why you should measure your pH and get your pH to the right level. So what if you don't have a pH meter? If you don't have a pH meter, well, you're not going to know how acidic or alkali your nutrient solution is. But if you're in the United States especially, I'm not sure what it is in other countries around the world, in the United States, water is generally between a 7 and an 8 when it comes out of the tap. Mine's about a 7.5. And when I add my nutrient solution, it brings it down to a 6.5, between 6 and 6.5, which is right where the lettuce prefers it. So I don't need to measure my pH every time I plant a crop of lettuce, um, every time I change my water. I know it's going to be pretty close to that range. It's also one of the easiest problems to fix. Like if you're noticing that your plants are not doing quite as well as you think they should and you've done everything else on the list and you've got yellowing leaves or they're not producing as well as they should, get a pH meter. They're cheap. It's an easy thing to test. Get some pH up or pH down and get it right where it needs to be and see if your plants don't improve. Next, I want to talk about total dissolved solids. Total dissolved solids is basically how much fertilizer or nutrients is in the solution and it's measured with a total dissolved solids meter. This is my total dissolved solids meter. My tap water comes out about a 200, which is kind of high for a lot of water. And when I add my nutrients, depending on what stage of growth they're in, I get it up to about 1,000 to about 1,100. And it matters because if you have too much fertilizer in your solution, your plants die, they can't take up the nutrients. They get what's called nutrient lockout. If they don't have enough, then they don't do as well. So you just kind of need that just right amount. So what happens if you don't have a meter to measure your total dissolved solids? Well, you, again, you can get pretty close just by following the directions on the back of your nutrients. Um, if you're using, for example, the Floor Grow series, which I've used in the past and have good luck with, I've also used Master Blend, when you add the recommended amounts to the water, it gets you right in the range that you need. I went for a long time without a total dissolved solids meter, and I didn't really have any problems. Once I measured it, I kind of knew what I was looking for, and it became more important when I had a recirculating system where I wasn't changing the water out every time, but I was adding to it so that I was able to tell how many nutrients were in the solution. But if you're doing like a crack heat or a deep water culture where you're changing the whole thing of water out every time, just by following the directions on the back of your nutrients, uh, back of the bottle of nutrients or the bag, you're going to get pretty close, even without a meter. So it's not a rule that you can bend or break, but you can probably get away without buying one of the total dissolved solids meters. But if you're interested, I'll put a link in, this, in the description below. I got mine at a local hydroponics store. But again, I don't think there's a ton of difference in the functionality of these things. I think they're all pretty good. Next, let's talk about aeration. This is a rule you can straight up break. If you're running a 
cracky system, you don't put an airstone in it. It looks just like a deep water culture, except for there's no circulation, there's no oxygenation of the water. And as the water levels go down, the plant adapts and grows roots to be able to absorb oxygen through the air, um, and it gets the oxygen it needs. Now you run a higher risk of root rot and other root-borne diseases as that water, that those plants are just kind of sitting in that relatively stagnant water, but it works just fine, especially on a fast-growing crop like lettuce. Tomatoes, peppers, I've seen people have success, but you run a higher risk the longer those roots sit in that water. So you may have to do some things like changing that water out, adding hydrogen peroxide, other measures to prevent root-borne diseases if you're not adding in aeration. Um, if you're doing a deep water culture, traditionally you have an airstone and a fish pump. And I'll put links to those in the description below if you're interested in something like that. I've done both. I think I have better luck when I add aeration than when I just do straight cracky. A lot of times when I'm doing a non-circulating system like a cracky setup with my lettuce or whatever, it works great for a while, but I start to kind of get that fungus, that mold on the, on the roots, which I don't really care for because it kills your plants and it ruins your grow. But if you throw an airstone in there, it's an easy way to mitigate those, those root problems. So you can bend this rule, you can break this rule, but I think for the amount of money that it costs to buy a pump and an airstone, is definitely worth putting one of those in if you've got water roots sitting in water. And lastly, I want to talk about lights. And lights are a whole hour-long, multi-part masterclass. Just like for the amount to measure, there's just a lot of stuff to know about lighting. And it, for me, anyway, it can feel very overwhelming. You're like, I can't even tell these lights apart. I mean, is this one as good as this one? Is this one better than this one? This one got five stars. This one got four stars. I don't. This one's pink. This one puts out full spectrum. What's best? Um, I don't want to get into all that. I want to focus on one thing, and that is the color of lights. The rule is that if you're growing vegetatively, like if you're growing for the leaves or you're doing start starts or you're not blooming something, then you want lights on the cooler end of the spectrum. And if you are blooming things like tomatoes, peppers, whatever, you want lights on the warmer end of the spectrum. Which, if you do the math, that means when the plant starts out, you have a cooler light and then you transition to warmer lights. Well, that means you've got to buy more lights or have a light that's capable of, of shifting spectrums as the plant grows. Um, do you have to spend that amount of money? Can you bend that rule? And absolutely, you can bend that rule. I'm growing tomatoes behind me and I have cool lights. I've never grown tomatoes before, and they did okay. I got blossoms, I got fruit. Um, I don't think I got as many as I would have had I used the proper lights and the proper spectrum. So you can definitely bend the rule. You just won't get that maximum yield that you would get if you were to follow the rule. So I hope that helps you understand some of the different rules that there are um, that are kind of more unique to hydroponics. And what happens if you don't have the money or don't bother checking your pH or can't buy every little gadget? Uh, you can still have a great garden. You can have a great success even without doing all of, this, all of those things. But it just might not be as awesome as it would be if you were to buy all of those things and do all of those things. Check your pH. Make sure you've got the right color lights. Get the oxygen in your water. Um, make sure you've got the right amount of fertilizer in there. I'd love to hear your experiences with some of the rules that you've bent or broken and let me know how it worked out. Like, did it not work at all? Did your plants just straight up die? Or did it? were you surprised that, hey, maybe I don't need to do all those things. Maybe it's easier if I do this or if I do that. So leave those things in the comments below. And thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.